Operation Varsity Blues is supposed to be a documentary about the 2019 college admissions scandal, but it resembles a true crime drama more than it does a documentary. It focuses on Rick Singer and how he did what he did. Everyone else is kind of on the periphery. When actors are reenacting actual events, then the scenes are both acted well and shot well. Another positive point is that the film uses real-world dialogue for these reenactments. The FBI recorded Singer's conversations with parents, and these call transcripts are used in the film script. The reenactments do short these call transcripts for clarity, but if you read the actual transcripts, then you'll see that this was a good move, because it seems as if in reality, almost 100% of the time, both speakers were usually only giving about half of their attention to the phone, at best. That lack of focus makes their conversations annoying to read or hear, so shortening them and polishing off the bumps is great for clarity's sake. Good acting, good filming, an interesting narrative, and it being based in reality means that the film's somewhat entertaining, yet while it's based in fact, it's not highly factual, and that's why I said it resembles a drama more than a documentary. In fact, at points, I think it was dishonest and misleading when it comes to trying to be factual. I'll go over the structure first, and then I'll talk about why what it covered and how was problematic. The structure. The story is told by focusing on the man who made the deals, Rick Singer. Meanwhile, little attention is paid to the admission system that he maneuvered in. Instead of giving the audience a wider perspective on the issue, corruption and questions about it loom in the background behind a small, solitary figure. By taking this gigantic issue of the college admissions process and making it a personal drama instead of a societal one, the film does become humanized, dramatic, entertaining, and bite-sized. That makes it a simple, shallow, but easy dip in the pool of the topic. However, this simplicity is harmed by many jump cuts, and these jump cuts usually don't add much to the film. What it cuts to varies. There are interviews from college-related experts, journalists, authors, and other giving their opinions on the scandal, footage of the real-world individuals involved in the scandal, excerpts from news stations' coverage, and random videos from teenagers talking about their hopes, feelings, thoughts, and so on surrounding the college admissions process. To give you an idea of how jumpy this is, the teenagers often don't even have their name shown. They're just meant to be a montage, a representative's sympathetic blur of concerned youth. All of that winds up being jarring instead of complimentary. It felt distracting to keep having random interviews Views and clips slotted in between focusing on the main character, Singer, the parents involved, and the sting operation itself. Plus, usually, all that these cuts give are questionable opinions. At many points, they're just derogatory, too. The interviewees basically just call the parents crazy, bad, selfish, whatever. For example, a common point is basically to just poo-poo the parents' mutual belief that their children could benefit from going to a prestigious school. The film frames them as if they're all just wackos who want to live vicariously through their kids to brag to their social circles, and that this is all that's really going on here. Why the film's problematic. I'm gonna go over these one by one. Half-truths. Because ultimately, where you do go to school has little or no effect on what will happen to you in the future. The United States has over 3,000 colleges. You have infinite choices. Forget about USC. Go someplace else. You can get a great education almost any place if you want it. The parents in this case didn't believe that. There's some truth being shown there. State schools and others not considered top tier do usually give quality education at cheaper rates. Many people graduate from these schools and do go on to be quite successful. This is true for various fields. Some universities may have a department that's better than the others and people will tend to go there more often for that department, but it's true that overall, these schools are on par with the top tier universities when it comes to the quality of education and how people do at their jobs afterward. Please note this does not include Greendale Community College, though it does include other community colleges and especially City College. By 2008, Ruffles had earned a bachelor's degree, not a two-year degree, a four-year degree. Where would you get your degree? If the answer is Greendale, prepare to get bones. Paid for by City College. License 264392. Did we give a degree to a dog? It's also true that some parents are more concerned with their images than with their own children. However, it's also true that this isn't the full story. Going to elite schools does offer a huge boost to the kids who go to them. Ignoring that is, in my opinion, very dishonest. While the term prestige does refer to something illusory, and the Ivy League schools give no massively better education to their students, the benefits that graduates from these schools get are substantial. It's not illusory that most graduates get these benefits. 
benefits, and it's understandable that parents would want their kids to have them. Ignoring these points felt uncomfortably biased to me. It's also not how I expect a good documentary to address a topic either. Its comparisons were too flippant, too misleading, and awkwardly moralizing points. Shallow coverage. Nothing's delved deeply into. The core issue, equal access to higher education based on merit and fair play alone, isn't strongly discussed. This makes the discussions that are had seem both clumsy and short. For instance, it makes a good point about certain sports skewing towards the rich, but then it also drags race into it. While it's true that most students going to such schools would be white, it's also true that the issue here is primarily one of class, not race. After all, at some of these schools, there are a significant portion of non-white students. The issue, the core issue, is whether or not the parents can afford the price of admission and how generational poverty can be enforced by the system. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Race, of course, plays an issue into things, but at the same point, that's generally due to historical reasons, issues such as inherited wealth. Mentioning the issue and not explaining it or really even giving any detail seemed a very casual way to address it. And it also was odd because it seemed to imply racism was the core issue and not the price of admission. A similar problem happens when it makes a good point about the SATs, allowing those who have disposable income to prep better and get higher scores. The problem comes when it acts as if advantages for the rich aren't further magnified by attending certain schools, which is misleading. After all, some limitations can be somewhat overcome. Many people can at least do some test prep. It's harder, but it's possible. Other advantages are not possible to obtain, no matter what people do. Many of these do come at the college level and influence future prospects for wealth. These issues aren't covered at all in the documentary. When issues such as benefits pre-college for the wealthy are discussed, then it seems dishonest to me to not also discuss post-college benefits. On top of that, acting as if parents who believe in these post-college benefits existence are simply dumb seems additionally dishonest. This brings me to my third point, what the film didn't cover and how it's misleading. There are several points to discuss here. Legacy admissions, grade inflation, networking advantages, job market biases, and future struggles in the job market. The film ignored a lot here. To keep it simple, I'll explain each point briefly and then sum up how I view it in a video game context, because I think actually a video game context is rather apt here. Legacy admissions. Legacy admissions are common for the upper classes. Schools do give a strong preference for the kids of alumni, yet this point is disregarded entirely in the film. The only time legacy admissions are mentioned is here. Is Harvard easier because I'm legacy? No, it's not. That doesn't mean shit. Your legacy means zero because... <laughs> Unless we're donating to a building, huh? Instead of addressing that dialogue, the documentary just moves on as if it was true. It never mentions the topic again. I double-checked. Letting that comment stand unchallenged as if it was true is very misleading in my opinion. Sure, the dialogue was from a real-world call, but it's on a documentary to separate the facts from the fiction. And what was said there is a fiction. Because in truth, legacy admissions are big. Harvard's class of 2022 is made up of over 36% legacy students. And this is a trend. It's an acknowledged way that many rich parents work the system legally. Donating a building or adding a wing to a building is not necessary for a legacy admission to happen. Other universities follow similar trends with legacy admissions too. As a result, I've seen comedy programs be more in-depth and honest on how much the rich are favored in admission processes. Well, of course, everyone's got such excellent results these days, but it's impossible to tell them apart, so we've had to go back to nepotism. But what about meritocracy, social mobility? What happens to children from poorer backgrounds? Well, they have all these A's these days, but then so do the posh kids, and the posh kids are expected to go to university, so we feel the kindest thing is to let them. Likewise, the benefits of going to such a school are not really addressed either, such as... Great inflation. Great inflation is never mentioned in the film, and it's also a huge problem and skews things. For example, in 2001, so many of Harvard students were given A grades that 90% of them graduated with honors. Great inflation is still a big problem, too. As The Crimson noted in 2013, which is a newspaper run by Harvard undergrads, 
The median grade at Harvard College is an A-, and the most frequently awarded mark is an A. Dean of Undergraduate Education J.M. Harris said on Tuesday afternoon, supporting suspicions that the college employs a softer grading standard than many of its peer institutions. This problem isn't unique to Harvard either. It also has consequences after graduation for everyone who relies on their college degrees from every school because of selection processes that do pay attention to GPA and and little else. A 2012 study in the Teachers College Record by Stuart Roystodger and Christopher Healy found that A's represent 43% of all letter grades, an increase of 28 percentage points since 1960 and 12 percentage points since 1988. Private colleges and universities give more top grades than public institutions with equal student selectivity, it said. Does it matter? Given that, the study says, college grades can influence a student's graduation prospects, academic motivation, postgraduate job choice, professional and graduate school selection, and access to loans and scholarships? The answer is yes. All of this means that students who don't graduate from lenient, prestigious schools are more likely to encounter challenges after graduation. After all, receiving lower grades at cheaper schools, despite being as or even more competent than their Ivy League peers, is a big issue. If grade inflation gives Harvard degrees a boost, then the degree would win unfairly against another. The data for the median GPA at Harvard is 3.65 as of 2013. I haven't found updated info despite looking. If this GPA hasn't gone up more, then that's still huge. It's also unlikely that the median's gone down. So let's go with that 3.65. State schools have lower GPAs. For example, Penn State's average is 3.12 and Ohio State's is 3.17. This general range of GPA is typical. It's about in this zone. Postgrad programs look at GPA and tend to like 3.0 to 3.5, but the higher, of course, the better. As the Cornell Daily Sun noted, a student's raw GPA is still the dominant and sometimes the only method that employers and graduate schools use to evaluate students' academic performance. At times, employers won't even ask for transcripts, instead soliciting a student's resume, which usually only contains his or her raw GPA. It is built into the employment and postgraduate world World, that a better GPA matters, even when that, regrettably, remains at odds with the notion of learning for learning's sake. Networking. It's not what you know, it's who you know. That saying has reality in it, and it's another advantage that the prestigious schools provide. Plenty of people use their connections to find employment and opportunities at every level of society. The rich are no different. These connections can open even more doors beyond the degree itself. The networking advantages also come in several forms. Faculty, affiliates, alumni, and peers. The more prestigious the school, the better the potential ties. Alumni are also a huge resource. Almost every job-seeking site says that if you're having trouble finding employment after graduation, then you should reach out to your school's alumni network. Your degree comes with a secret weapon, your college's alumni network. In fact, many schools maintain a list of alumni who have expressed that they want to help new grads with their job search. You may be able to get a word-of-mouth recommendation, which would definitely help your resume stand out from the some sometimes hundreds of other applicants. To sum all of that up, while prestige can be dismissed as illusory, the benefits that prestigious universities provide isn't illusory. Spots at them are coveted for good reasons, and the documentary completely neglects to mention this. Instead, it seems to push forward a falsehood that these universities offer equal opportunities when compared to other universities. The way I see it, all of this can be considered very simply in a video game context, and it's how I view it. Imagine an MMO with PvP. Your scroll of academia may look the same, and you may be an equally skilled player or even better than the person going into the PvP arena with you. However, if microtransactions exist, there's a problem. You game to get your equipment, you practice whatever skills were needed, beat whatever boss, there's a decent chance that you grinded away for hours making sure you got the drops that you needed. You didn't just click buy in the game's cash store. However, if your opponent could afford the microtransaction for the plus five scroll of academia, then they're going to have an unfair advantage in the arena. Your level may be maxed out, but so is theirs. If raw power is the sole determinant and their DPS is higher, well, things aren't looking good for you. Well, you tried. 
I see it this way because losing in a PvP arena equates pretty well with real-world outcomes. You'll probably find a job eventually, win a PvP match eventually, but with these stacked odds, it makes sense that there is a myth that if you have a college degree, you have a job. The fact is that approximately 53% of college graduates are unemployed or working in a job that doesn't require a bachelor's degree. It takes the average college graduate three to six months to secure employment after graduation. A student benefits from having a career-seeking strategy in previous work experiences, otherwise a resume might be lost in a stack of hundreds for a specific job. Compare 53% unemployed or working a job that doesn't require a bachelor's degree to say Yale's graduating class of the same year. 96.9% employed or in graduate school within six months of graduation. This problem has held true in the past too. For example, in 2020, only 8.3% of Yale grads were seeking employment after six months compared to about half of the nation's graduates in 2020. Other prestigious schools fare similarly in the job market. It's clear that you're going to have an easier time finding a job in your chosen field if you have an Ivy League degree. Even their salaries tend to be higher. It's also clear that this disparity is a harsh reality for many people. Many people have student debt. Rich people tend not to. As a result, they'll often need to worry about bills and debt as they also desperately hunt for employment. This is why many people working minimum wage jobs do have college degrees. They have to pay their bills and they can't find work in their chosen fields. So given all of this, it becomes obvious why prestigious schools would be wanted. It's akin to gaming the system. After all, while microtransactions are a hated move in many games, they do give an edge if they allow players to purchase stat boosting items. The situation in the collegiate world and job market is much the same. If your real world future depended on it, such as if you knew you'd literally be sucked into a video game, a common plot, then you'd probably spend and not go for the standard, if you could afford it, of course. There are no guarantees in life. Maybe you'd do equally well or better with standard. Worst case, you'd probably just need to spend more time grinding to survive, and you'd eventually get to the portal and enter the real world. But statistically, people holding the weapon that does several times more damage will probably beat you to the portal and get into the real world much, much faster portraying the parents as narcissistic villains. Instead of recognizing that going to these universities does give significant real-world benefits, the film seems to just dismiss the very idea of that. As a result, it frames parents who are interested in those benefits as foolish, as if their illegal maneuvers were all made for bragging rights and their egos. It was just greed, 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 and nothing else. That combo of inaccuracy and villainizing the parents felt dumb to me. The moralizing just seemed over the top. This this is because, while I think that the parents involved in the scandal acted illegally and inappropriately, I don't think that the film made a good case for them being uncaring about their own kids. I think they probably still did care about their own. After all, it makes sense that parents would want their kids to have the best in life, especially if those kids are already pampered by them to an extreme level, and this pampering has them worried about how they'll fare once they get out into the world. I found this idea supported by how many of the kids wanted continued affluence, but expected to be able to cheat or bypass parts of the system. They seem to expect life to just work out for them. That attitude speaks of parents who do pamper their children because the children are passively accepting of shortcuts and very optimistic. For them, doing well is just part of life and they're used to the idea that their parents are going to keep promoting that. They don't have the same fears that people living paycheck to paycheck have and as a result, neither do their kids. Add their optimism and passivity onto how over-involved parents tend to worry, thinking that they need to control their kids because their kids lack direction, and it seems to me that the parents were more misguided and haughty than anything else. It seems to me that they didn't care whether or not their kids would be taking the spots of any kids who worked hard. They just figured their children deserved the best. In other words, I think they were fine with putting their children before others' children and did so unnecessarily, but I don't think that means they didn't care about their kids. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe these parents were all as narcissistic and uncaring as the film portrayed them to be, and they didn't actually care about their own children's futures, but did care about what they could say at parties. However, I don't think that the documentary made a convincing case for that, and as a documentary, I think that was rather gossipy and odd. If it was going to portray the parents that way, then I think it should have at least put forth better arguments about the parents' true motives 
and true feelings. Instead, it made this true crime sort of story feel more like a morality play than a documentary, something more based on a true story than about a true story. Final thoughts. I wondered why the film would be so misleading and myopic on many points. I can't think of any good reasons. After all, it's not as if the film only focuses on Rick Singer. It intersperses many opinions and clips via jump cuts. You never even learn the names of the various teenagers shown as you watch the film, and they give a lot of their opinions, feelings, thoughts. It's a weird, depersonalized personalization of the kids applying. It's a blur of people and their thoughts. Few facts are presented. Yet, if the documentary is going to be bite-sized on the topic, then I think it should at least be heavily fact-laden within its little bite circle. The only reason I could come up with about why it went how it did is that it wanted to tell a story. A story about greedy parents ignoring reality to sate their own fantasies, their own overblown egos, and pointlessly harming their own children in the process. Meanwhile, in this salacious tale, an uncaring, mysterious con man, complete with a sad past to justify his dishonest actions, leads these parents to their doom, and their children as well. Overall, this framing makes it a kind of entertaining watch, but it felt too gossipy, dramatic, and inaccurate for me. I wondered what others thought, and after I saw it, I looked up reviews. I saw some that compared it to the Lifetime movie. That's currently available to see for free on YouTube with ads, so I gave it a look for comparison's sake. I can see why people made the comparison to this film. Operation Varsity Blues is better acted and filmed. It's also noticeably less overdramatic than the Lifetime film, which is called The College Admissions Scandal. You did it for one reason. So you could have something to say at cocktail parties that will make your friends jealous. That is not true. What would have been so terrible if I had worked as a waiter and I had played in clubs? What would have been so terrible if I had, if I had failed at that, if I had starved? Sorry, I wasn't the son you wanted. The Lifetime film focuses more on the children and the parents instead of focusing on Rick Singer like the documentary did. Yet, the two aren't as drastically different as they should be. Their storytelling is awkwardly similar. Both movies are more focused on telling a dramatic story than they are on the scandal's context, complete with worried phone calls ripped from reality and revolving around Singer's dialogue. Meanwhile, neither film deeply examines the wider context in a fact-focused way. Both also act as if the parents did what they did for clout and little else. Both movies also end on a moralizing note, which chastises the parents for never really caring about their children. If you're in the mood for a story that's shallow but entertaining in a true crime sort of format, then you might enjoy this Netflix movie more, and if you want something campier, then you'd probably like the Lifetime movie more, yet I think neither movie is particularly good. If you're actually wanting a documentary to watch, then I'd skip this one. While it's supposed to be a documentary, I think it's really not. Instead, I think it's more of a based on a true story opinion piece slash drama. For that reason, it feeling miscategorized and not what I tuned in for, I've got to lower its final score. Since it was also misleading on many points, such as on how legacy admissions actually matter, I've got to knock it down even more. After all, my review here is much shorter than its runtime of an hour and 40 minutes, yet I know that I've covered more about college admissions issues than it did, and the real world effects. When it comes to the scandal itself, all the film mainly showed was that parents paid Rick Singer to have their kids fake test scores and fake being on sports teams. It mentioned bribery and how he funneled funds through his foundation, but I don't think there was really much else to it. I feel like reading an article about the scandal would show about as much and be more factual and take less time. I think there's just not much worthwhile in this film at all.